Our next speaker is Gabriel Rockhill. Gabriel is a philosopher, cultural critic, and political theorist. He teaches at Villanova University and Greater Ford Prison, and he directs the critical theory workshop at the Sorbonne. His recent books include Counter History of the Present, uh, published in 2017, Interventions in Contemporary Thought in 2016, and Radical History in the Politics of Art from 2014. You may remember him from one of our more popular interviews we've had where we spoke to him about the Frankfurt School and the creation of what we often refer to as the, the fake left. Uh, so here he is, Gabriel. So thank you so much, comrades. It's great to be here with you and join you for this important event. I uh, would like to say a few kind of congratulatory remarks for Carlos, and then I have basically three kind of comments based on the book that uh, inspired my thinking and conversations I've been having with organizers uh, in my circles. So first and foremost, I think that the book is quite uh, an important achievement at two levels, at least. One is that it manifests the collective ethos of everything that you've been doing at Midwestern Marks, which is quite an incredible undertaking. It's very impressive that a group of people can kind of build on their own such a significant kind of uh, collectively resourced uh, institute that provides political education, brings people into the struggle, breaks down complex ideas, makes them accessible. Uh, you occupy a very important position. And I think that it's uh, to the kind of the testament to, it's a testament to Carlos, the ways in which he's been working with other people in this collective endeavor, not simply to fight intellectually against the purity fetish, but to build institutional power in order to struggle back against it. And that collectivity and that institution building uh, should never be given short shrift because it's one of the most important things that we can do. The book itself, though, is highly uh, accessible. It's very well written. It is urgent insofar as it addresses one of the central problems facing the contemporary left, uh, particularly within the Western and imperialist world. It provides a resounding critique of the purity fetish, of controlled counter hegemony and other such things, while also advancing a positive project. So it's dialectical through and through, and that's one of its, uh, one of its strengths. And it is also a kind of manifesto for the anti-imperialist left. And so I would encourage everyone to read the book. Uh, as Radhika pointed out, it is also uh, relatively thin, so you can get through it. It is erudite without being bogged down in kind of academic referentiality. Regarding the points that I wanted to highlight, the very first one is that Carlos provides us, I think, a very astute account of what I would call the dialectics of socialism, meaning that the relationship between capitalism and socialism is not the relationship between two fixed socioeconomic systems as if there would be capitalism over here, which would be A, and socialism over here, that would be B. On the contrary, socialism is a collective project that is built out of the skeletal system of capitalism in its decline. Therefore, socialism inherits so many of the problems that plague the history of capitalism, and it is tasked with doing somewhat the impossible that is moving from a system that is based principally on profit over people to one in which people are put at the center of the socioeconomic system. One of the favorite jokes that I've heard about the socialist project is the following. It says that socialism looks good on paper, but in reality, you just get invaded by the United States. This, of course, addresses the fact that we've never had a free socialist country emerge in the history of the world. We have only had what Michael Parenti calls socialism under siege. So every single socialist experiment has been the target of imperialist destruction. This means that socialism as it emerges in the very real world has to deal with these very concrete material factors that it does not control because it is coming from the bottom up, uh, meaning that its struggle is from the bottom up. Moreover, socialist countries need to develop by starting out from a point of, for a position within the geopolitical world of structural underdevelopment. And they have to do that without relying on many of the principal mechanisms of development under capitalism, such as colonialism and extreme forms of super exploitation. Moreover, socialists inherit all of the political and moral injustices of the capitalist system. Uh, baked in racism, uh, misogyny and gender oppression, all of the ideologies of the capitalist world. Uh, 
So what we should actually expect, and I think that Carlos's book does a good job of bringing this to the fore, is that the dialectics of socialism is such that we should never expect a pure and perfect socialist system to kind of spring forth as if from the head of Zeus, but instead, for it to be racked by a whole series of contradictions related to the fact that it is born out of a system of human degradation, which is the system of capitalism. What is absolutely remarkable, and again, Carlos's book brings this to the fore, as that in spite of all of these odds or against all of these odds, if you look at the quantifiable data that we currently have, and in fact, there's an interesting study that was done in 1986 that crunched all of the extant data from the World Bank, which couldn't be accused of being a communist sympathizer and is arguably the uh, largest body of data globally. This study found in 1986 that the physical quality of life index, which tracks track such things as life expectancy, infant mortality, access to health care, access to education and other such things, that the uh, socialist countries had a more favorable performance than all capitalist countries at a similar level of development in 22 of 24 comparisons that were undertaken in the study by Shirley Sarasato and Howard Waitzkin. So what's extraordinary is that even though socialism is um, emerges in this dialectical tension with capitalism, it has nonetheless proven itself successful at the level of its material gains for uh, working class people. In that regard, Carlos's book is an invitation for us to think very differently about the socialist project than the Western uh, kind of fetishization of purity tends to make us think about it. That is both recognizing the extreme difficulties of the socialist project and also supporting and celebrating the incredible, incredible gains that have been made for humanity and for that matter, for planet Earth, given the environmental policies of the socialist countries, or at least uh, in many instances. My two other comments have to do with a series of thoughts that were provoked in both reading Carlos's book and then discussing it with some people who are very close to me. Uh, the first is uh, how the purity fetish relates to the longstanding criticisms of utopian socialism, and in particular those that were already expressed by Marx and Engels. You can look at the Communist Manifesto or in the Poverty of Philosophy, where Marx explains, I have the quote here, but I won't uh, read it in the interest of time. Marx explains that utopian socialism was largely a product of the lack of development of both the capitalist system and the state of class struggle at that point in time, meaning that the class struggle had not yet fully revealed to the working class the systemic workings of the capitalist ruling class, and therefore scientific socialism as emerged with the work of Marx and Engels was actually a consequence of material evolution of both capitalism and class struggle. And so one of my questions for Carlos is how would you understand the purity fetish in relationship to these kind of longstanding critiques of utopian socialism and in particular those critiques that foreground the material forces that are operative behind these ideologies. I think this echoes some of the things that Radhika said, because I'd like to hear Carlos more on the central role played by the labor aristocracy in the history of the imperial left, and what kind of material forces are operative behind this, you know, uh, promotion of an idea that socialism has to be something that is structurally impossible. It has to be absolutely pure and come forth in the world in a way that would be untainted by the history of capitalism. It has to be basically immaterial. And ultimately, that's what a lot of them want is an immaterial socialism, meaning one that would never exist so that the extant social relations that tend to situate them on the top of the labor structures globally persist and maintain their own material support, superiority in that regard. My last comment slash question, it was also kind of provoked by a similar series of thoughts. And that is that if we take seriously the material role of the labor aristocracy in the imperial core for promoting certain forms of uh, ideology, such as that of the purity fetish, then what are we to make of, uh, this is a comment recently made in a book called Communisme by Bruno Geek that I strongly recommend. He said that uh, drawing on Gramsci, that this struggle, the class struggle within the imperial core takes on a different form. And that is that since socialist revolutions have generally uh, been 
proven themselves to be more successful, obviously within the tri-continent, within the global south, and we have not had one within the global north or the imperial core, doesn't that mean that the class struggle in the imperial core takes on a slightly different form? And Gig draws on the distinction that Gramsci makes between a war of position and a war of maneuver, saying that within the imperial core, there is such a deeply developed level of industrialized ignorance due to the control of the cultural apparatus and the kind of programmed ignorance through the schooling system and through the, the general kind of cultural institutions, if you will, of the Western world, that the Western left is faced with a very fundamental problem. And that is that the masses, for the most part, are profoundly uneducated about very basic things about how the world works. So Gig's argument is that therefore what we need in the imperial core is a war of position, a kind of trench warfare in which we focus principally on hegemonic struggle, meaning struggle for political education. And that the war of movement, the war in which you'd actually be able to seize power in a revolutionary manner, like has been done across the global south in certain instances, is for the most part, I take it, that's at least what he's implicitly suggesting, not really on the table at this point in time. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't advocate for that. Uh, and it doesn't mean as well that, you know, I think that someone like George Jackson is quite clear uh, in this regard, if there is not a revolutionary situation, the onus is on us to produce and make that revolutionary situation. So Gig's position, I take it, is that, well, to do that in the, revolu in the imperial core uh, requires tasks that are slightly different. And that the fight against the purity fetish that Carlos is undertaking in this book is part of, I take it, a kind of larger struggle for political education and for wresting control away from the controlled counter hegemony while building up a real counter hegemony like Midwestern Marx is trying to do, like the uh, International Manifesto Group is trying to do, like the Critical Theory Workshop is trying to do, and like a lot of other organizations that we all work with are trying to do. And so these are my three kind of general thoughts on Carlos's book and a few questions for the discussion to follow. And I'll finally close just by saying that it's extremely impressive and inspiring to have such a young scholar and vibrant mind doing such important work at an early stage in his career. And I really look forward to continuing to collaborate with everyone at Midwestern Marks, learn more from you and continue the struggle.